Okay, hello, my name is Travis, and we are at the last video in this series where I've talked about how Web3 users onboard into the Web3 ecosystem. The very first videos, I focus mostly on the UI and what an end user sees, and in the last several videos, I've gone deeper into what is happening on the back end, what is happening when you create a Web3 wallet, what does a peer-to-peer -peer network look like, and also what is happening on the blockchain when you send Ether uh, to another wallet. And now I'm going to talk lastly about what a decentralized application is. And as always, it's helpful to let me move over to this to start with what web two currently looks like. What is the software architecture of a web two app? Well, let's just look at it very simply. So we start here at the top with a smartphone or a computer, and this is a client that is making HTTP requests to a company's server. So let's say this is a Facebook server. We are making requests and getting front end code in the, form of HTML, JavaScript, CSS to render that front end, that user interface on our browser. And this front end is being controlled by the back end or the, the business logic or the application logic that Facebook coded. Now this is all being run from and deployed to Facebook's server. And they have complete control over the Facebook database as well. So if I'm a user on there and I make posts that the Facebook company does not agree with, then they can remove me. They can ban my account temporarily or permanently. They could also, they just have access to modify your, the data that is associated with your account. It is completely under Facebook's control. You accept their terms and conditions. Now let's look at what a decentralized app looks like. So this is a regular web application and going into the world of decentralized applications, we have this client which is now running crypto software. Uh, as you've seen in the previous videos, I'm using MetaMask for these videos. And so a decentralized app, it's really interesting because it looks similar to a regular web two application. The front end, is very similar except for that small button up at the top right where it says connect wallet or now it's showing my wallet's already connected up here so it's showing my address this is really the only major difference that would indicate to a user that they're using a decentralized app versus a normal app now um, and this is because the front end is similar in technology to the front end of a web 2 app they all use js css html to do that now let me explain the flow of what's happening on a web 3 application the application when i go here and i want to get more die and i put in point one ETH, I want to get that much worth of DAI, and I click swap, and I do confirm swap. Now let me explain what just happened. The app Uniswap created an unsigned transaction that was sent to my wallet. This unsigned transaction, as I said in the previous video, transactions are just data packets. And so you can think of it as basic information. It's saying that this wallet wants to swap this amount of ETH for this amount of DAI, and obviously it's gonna have other data. It's not that simple, but you can think of it as being that simple. And what the reason it sends it to my wallet and why MetaMask is, is asking me to confirm is because MetaMask controls my private key. The Uniswap application has no awareness of my private key. And before this is a valid transaction, it needs to be signed by my private key. So this is what I'm doing right now. I'm confirming that this all looks right, uh, that this was this is a multi-call that's being sent from this URL right here, and I accept the network fee that I'm gonna pay for it. So I click that, and what that did was that signed the transaction with my private key and sent it back into Uniswap 
which is going to now send it to a validator on the Ethereum network. And now we're back into everything I showed in the previous video, where a validator confirms this transaction, that it was signed by me with the correct private key. It goes into the validator's mempool, it gets included in a block, and that block gets propagated throughout the Ethereum network. So we're to that point right now, um, and I won't go into that. If you want to see more about that, just go back to the previous video on how the blockchain gets updated. I want to stay on this for a second to finish explaining what a DApp architecture is. What this transaction has included in it is also the specific smart contracts to call on the Ethereum blockchain. When the Uniswap developers deployed this application, they weren't deploying backend code to any central server. They were deploying smart contract code in the form of a transaction sent to a validator. And this validator included that transaction in, the, in a block. And um, now, that now that smart contract code lives somewhere in some block, in some transaction on the blockchain. It is now has a, um, a contract address, just like my wallet address, except all smart contracts have something called a wallet address, or sorry, a contract address. And we can actually go in and look at the code. Like, remember how in the previous video I said that blockchains are publicly accessible databases so we can find the exact smart contract that this um, that this transaction called so here is the swap transaction let's go to view on block explorer and let's see that we sent we sent this transaction to this contract right here this is the smart contract for swapping one token for another on the Coven testnet. And there will be a different address probably on the Ethereum mainnet, but I'm gonna click into this smart contract. I click on contract right here. And this is the literal smart contract code that the Uniswap developers had already deployed to the Ethereum testnet. This is probably my transaction here. Yeah, this is my transaction. Okay, so you might be wondering more about what a smart contract is, and now let's talk about that here. So this was my, when I clicked swap and I clicked confirm, and this was, this transaction was sent to the Ethereum validator, and a validator confirmed the transaction and included it in this block. This is what this is right here. This is my swap transaction. And inside of that transaction, it's saying to call this smart contract address with specific variables like exchange this much ether for this much die. And so it's it's calling a specific function, a swap function within the this testnet smart contract here might look something like this and it's passing in variables like how much in how much out that kind of thing address like what address to what should we send that the token back to and then it's this smart contract is going to update the state of the blockchain so here's my wallet right here zero x blah 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 and it ends in 2116 and it is going to decrease my account by this much ether and then add a die to my account so this is actually how the swap transaction goes through. All right, cool. That is the difference between a decentralized application and a regular Web 2 application. It's again, it's from the back end. The front end is exactly the same technology, but the back end is different. We deploy the application logic to the blockchain in the form of smart contracts. And it's really interesting because this is a permissionless type of model right here. What I mean by permissionless is we're not, I'm not, I don't require the approval of a company like Facebook to utilize their service. In this model I do, and Facebook can withdraw that from me at any point if I breach their terms and conditions. But with a smart contract, anybody can make calls to these smart contracts. And that is why one of the properties of blockchains is that they are permissionless and that a random or anonymous 
person with wallet with a wallet and with ether to spend can utilize any of the smart contracts deployed to the ethereum network also a really interesting property is that um, these smart contracts are and all blockchain data for that matter is immutable it means that we can never change it once it's deployed the smart contract can never be removed or modified from the ethereum blockchain it is like set in stone um, as the blockchain continues to update that transaction with that smart contract code will never be changed it will exist in the smart contract or in the blockchain data for eternity or for however long this ethereum blockchain stays in existence so it is immutable and it can never be censored by a government or any other entity that might want to do so so that is the end of this series this entire series where we looked at the onboarding experience into web3 we talked about going from um, a bank or fiat currency into cryptocurrency with an exchange creating a wallet and getting crypto from the exchange into the wallet we did a deep dive into what a web3 wallet is uh, send transactions uh, or sorry send ether to other wallets and then connect that wallet to a decentralized app and then in these last several videos i went through more technical detail into what is happening on the back end so i hope you all got some use out of these videos i am trying to curate this to be at the level for a, a product designer so not a software engineer you're going to need to go a level deeper in order to understand all of that but i want to build more or better mental models for product designers so we can design in the web3 space more effectively web3 is a very exciting revolution that i don't think a lot of people really know what is going to come with it and it's all of these different product categories are emerging right now and i just think that the average person isn't aware of all the innovation that's happening here so if you're interested you caught, caught a scent of interest with these videos then i highly suggest you continue to learn and try to get your foot in the door in this space thank you